I never beat Radiant Dawn when I was a child. FE10 is a bit of a black sheep. Despite the grand, ambitious story and cast, it sold worse than any other international release of a Fire Emblem title to date. But it did become a cult classic for hardcore fans, and its relative rarity has caused the price of secondhand copies to skyrocket. Having beaten most games in the series by now, it's really only fair I come back 15 years later to give it another shot and see whether the game is actually worth the $200 price tag, or if my 13-year-old self was correct to dump it halfway through. Creating a new file prompts you to transfer over save data from Path of Radiance, which famously doesn't work sometimes in the international release, causing your game to crash if you played easy mode in FE9. This happens because they removed the JP-exclusive Maniac difficulty from FE9 during localization and added an easy mode, and I guess they didn't account for the save files of FE9 having regional version differences. What's hilarious is that the international release of FE10 kept the easy, normal, hard naming convention from the localization of FE9 without actually changing any of the difficulty modes, so these difficulties in FE10 are actually the original JP normal, hard, and maniac settings which do not correspond to the localized difficulty settings from FE9. We are off to a great start. The opening cutscene features the bad guys searching for Micaiah, who asks her pet bird not to make any noise, and for some reason it's the bird that gives her away and not, like, her voice. Makaya gets captured and is bailed out by her adopted son slash primary love interest. We, we have to stop Fire Emblem writers from doing this kind of thing. We get to watch a sick action sequence in which So fights by exclusively kicking the enemy soldiers so they don't need to show any blood on screen when he stabs them with a knife. We cut to the prologue chapter which opens with an obligatory fight against bandits, because that's every single Fire Emblem game. Your characters belong to the Dawn Brigade, a group of heroic rebels opposing the cruel post-war occupation force that's competing for the civilians killed high score list, so the responsibility of saving the townsfolk from a group of convenient tutorial bandits falls in the hands of teenagers and 30-year-old women who look like teenagers. Edward is one of those really fun characters that isn't actually that great because after leaving the tutorial chapter he can't really fight more than one or two dudes before he needs to get healed. He has pretty enormous growth rates and watching numbers go up is the only way to make my brain release dopamine, so I spend the entire chapter having him mow down as many enemies as possible. Micaiah starts at level 1 with, like, no stats, so I mostly use her to heal Edward. While her abilities are important to the game's narrative, in gameplay, Micaiah is the worst healer of all time because she needs to drain her own very, very limited health pool in order to heal others, which takes her entire turn and nearly kills her. The other character in this chapter is Leonardo, who is clearly a huge ripoff of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I mean, he's right there! How'd they get away with this? I don't actually want to use Leonardo since the people who made this game are contractually obligated to stick to the standard Fire Emblem design trope, so your early game archer isn't very good. The chapter boss has enough damage to one-shot Micaiah outright, which is something you're probably going to hear me say pretty frequently for the rest of the game. The post-chapter cutscene introduces the antagonist of the first story arc, who immediately starts killing his own men to show how evil he is. Fire Emblem villains aren't known for subtlety, but at least he's not purple. He's just like some guy who wants to do every single war crime. Chapter 1 summarizes the post-war events leading to the occupation of Dayan in which the Benion Empire's occupation forces have decided to basically hunt Dayan civilians for sport. With all able-bodied men sent to prison camps, this occupation is exclusively opposed by the five-man Dawn Brigade. Since the Dawn Brigade can't defeat an entire army by themselves, they meet up and plan to escape the city, but you don't get to use Soph yet because the stats are too high. I do get to use Nolan, who is by far my most sturdy unit, so I have him take most of the hits while I clear out the enemies. I confirm that the soldiers guarding the escape zone do not move to attack even when you're inside of their range, so I confidently have Leonardo plink the boss, who apparently was programmed to start moving after he's taken damage. I figured that losing Leonardo wouldn't be a big deal, but apparently the Ninja Turtles are considered to be an irreplaceable cultural treasure and I get a game over for letting him die to a random crit. 
Cool. I am more careful on my next attempt, but the boss is impossible to hit for some reason. The Dawn Brigade escapes into a crowded market, and the civilians helpfully form a line to block any incoming pursuit, which the Benion soldiers solve by just indiscriminately shooting children of arrows. Micaiah then unescapes in order to have a really dramatic moment where she works a miracle and almost dies to save the child, which is very, very impressive because nobody here has ever heard of a healing staff. This actually increases the overall body count because Micaiah now has to escape a second time and the civilian slayer himself shows up to get a triple kill. So, um, good job, I guess? Chapter 2 opens with a woman named Laura joining the Dawn Brigade to do crime, which is really funny because she's your typical early game healer, and this is the first thing that happens after the narrative made a huge deal over Micaiah's rare and special power to heal the injured. The map introduces a couple of new game mechanics like climbable ledges and elevation, which gives huge bonuses to accuracy and evasion while you have the high ground. You also finally get to use Soap, whose stats are pretty good. There's a cutscene partway through in which Jared shows up again, but he doesn't actually do anything but wait outside while he sends in like four men before giving up. I advance through the map giving most of the experience to Nolan and Edward, but I do try out Micaiah's new armor slash horse killing spell versus the boss. After finishing combat, the Dawn Brigade escapes the manor, but forgets to bring Laura, and Micaiah runs off alone into the woods to find her and immediately gets captured. Chapter 3 is a prison break in which Soph rescues Micaiah and the other prisoners, which includes some NPCs, a playable character, and a suspicious twink with higher stats than me. I need to advance through a dense pack of enemies, which means that my fragile magic users really aren't good because it's difficult to put them on the front line. Micaiah can one-shot some of the enemies, which almost makes up for the fact that some of the enemies can one-shot her. Laura can talk to and recruit her childhood friend, a man whose hair appears to be formed entirely out of iceberg lettuce. I'm not going to use him very much, as you can only reasonably raise so many characters in the Dawn Brigade, as you need to tightly funnel your experience in order to catch up weak characters with the overwhelmingly stronger new recruits the game just flings at you with wild abandon later on. The boss does charge at you in this chapter, but I actually anticipated it this time and rob him blind before Micaiah reduces him into his individual constituent atoms. Micaiah sometimes does an okay job of making magic look strong in this game, but that's only because of her special book, since my other mage can't even take out an armored unit by herself despite their supposed weakness to magic over physical attacks. I completely forgot about a game mechanic in which you can have Micaiah order allied units to get a move on, which I thought didn't matter here until reinforcements showed up from behind and obliterated the shopkeeper lady, who gets away somehow at roughly 500 miles an hour. Since we happen to save a merchant caravan from prison, I will finally be able to access base camp between chapters, giving me access to game mechanics such as shopping and going to the forge. The merchants share a suspiciously specific and accurate rumor that there's a forgotten prince of Dayan raising an army in the middle of the desert, which Micaiah confirms by consulting her mind palace. Going forward, base camp includes optional conversations that probably shouldn't be optional since they're used to give you playable characters, money, and items. I'm actually a big fan of these since you get genuinely good characterization and dialogue free of the shackles of the main storyline. And since Radiant Dawn unfortunately doesn't include any unique dialogue for support conversations like in the previous four games, this is sometimes all of the dialogue that even exists for optional characters who otherwise don't speak outside of their join chapter like the Iceberg Lettuce guy. The shop sells a dagger with 5 more might and 10 more crit than Soph's starting knife, and it's cheap to where he can earn exactly enough money to buy it by selling his current dagger. I spend the rest of my money at the forge making juiced up iron weapons with excellent damage and accuracy to keep Edward and Nolan on pace with the enemies. Chapter 4 kicks off when Micaiah gets a sudden discord notification and leads the group indoors. Soph suggests that these stone ruins were probably constructed by Lagoos due to their superior animalistic strength, which suggests a cool new conspiracy theory on how the pyramids were really built. By furries. 
Micaiah pokes fun at Soph for being racist as a kid, an affliction that Soph overcame as soon as he was no longer 14 years old. This section on racism, equality, and life-changing perspectives is kind of undercut 30 seconds later because the first Lagoos to show up in the story immediately talks about literally hunting you for dinner. I might be about to have Soph kill a half dozen Lagoos with an explicitly Lagoos killing knife, but at least he won't say a slur. Edward and Nolan get plenty of action, while I have Soph skirt the perimeter to pick up all the treasure. Like every other chapter, using Micaiah here feels like an escort mission because the tigers have enough damage to one-shot Micaiah if they get their claws on her, and these smaller cats don't, but they do strike twice, which more or less accomplishes the same thing. The twin bosses are named Pain and Agony, which is probably in reference to how much damage they just took from my units. Call an ambulance, but not for me. Micaiah meets a supermodel who does shampoo commercials and his cool dogs who turn out not to be dogs. The trio of Lagoos are planning a cross-country trip but didn't bring a passport, so they vaguely hang out with Micaiah for the remainder of part one. Wolf Queen Nyla wants to help Micaiah fight, despite having literally just met and having nothing to do with this country besides a desire to leave. Her solution is to hand over Volug, her retainer, and treat him as a dog so nobody finds out that he's a Lagoos. I can't help but feel like Nyla and Volug have some sort of freaky dom sub thing going on here, and it's making both me and Micaiah uncomfortable. Edward, Leonardo, and Nolan have a heart-to-heart -heart about getting stronger, but I don't know how to break it to Leonardo that he is never going to level up again. Chapter 5 starts with Micaiah taking Volug for a walk like a responsible dog owner, and they run into a trio of characters from FE9 under attack from Benion's soldiers. All of these characters will join my army in the next chapter, but I do need to rescue them first. Jill is a very, very good unit to invest your resources into, and Zehark makes you wonder why you bothered training Edward. I rush up north with Volug because I don't want the green units to gain zero experience off of the enemies when Volug could gain one point of experience instead. Also, hold on. Volug is wearing a collar, like a dog collar. Did Queen Nyla put that on him? I kind of forgot that Edward has, like, 5 defense, so he gets 2-shot and I have to restart the chapter because no god nor king can convince me to give up on Big Ed. I only get to play for 6 turns before the chapter ends, so I let Soph solo the entire right side of the map. I'm not really concerned about EXP loss by overusing temporarily overpowered units like Soph and Volug, because Radiant Dawn's entire gameplay philosophy is to throw new and powerful units at you every single time you turn a corner. Despite not gaining meaningful experience, Volug is gaining weapon rank, which is absolutely critical for Lagoos since they gain 5 might whenever they go up a rank. Micaiah meets up with the Lost Prince of Dayan and his blatantly evil advisor who also controls all of his thoughts and actions. Since Micaiah's notoriety and special powers are already well established, Izuku decides she'd make for a good figurehead and appoints her to lead the Dayan Liberation Army, which seemingly consists of exactly three people before Micaiah agrees to join. The threat of the new Liberation Army causes Benion to retaliate in the only way they know how, killing civilians at random. I gather up all of the stat-boosting items I've collected up until now, and I feed them to Jill because wyverns are kind of busted. Chapter 6 is split into two halves. The first half bombards you with flying reinforcements that come in from all sides, making it pretty difficult to keep Laura and Micaiah out of harm's way unless you look up a guide ahead of time and just spawn camp the Pegasi of Jill. I'm still diligently training Edward, but his low defense is getting really annoying. The second half of the chapter involves Benion using hostages to convince Micaiah's army to drop their weapons, but since the Benion soldiers can't resist the urge to immediately kill civilians, they decide to execute them on the spot instead of accepting Micaiah's surrender and winning the battle. A squad of cavalry decides to mutiny rather than fighting for Benion, giving you a chance to rescue the prisoners. Volu gets hit seven times in a row by horsemen using hit and run tactics, something I forgot they could do because I don't have any horsemen in my army. The death of Micaiah's beloved puppy dog results in an immediate game over for some reason, forcing me to restart the chapter. My second try goes much better, but the bloodthirsty Benny on troops do manage to take out a non-combatant. I have Soph get revenge on the boss, which results in him hitting his strength cap at the earliest possible level. Fiona, the mutineer, offers to join the Liberation Army, pledging her lance and the men under her command to Micaiah, which is 
kind of useless because her men no longer exist outside of cutscenes and Fiona is maybe the weakest character in the game. Jared starts complaining about the insurgents because he doesn't want Benny on proper to catch wind of the news and ask him why he's so obsessed with slaughtering innocents. Not to be outdone in the evil department, evil advisor Izuka proposes that the Liberation Army's next move should be to poison the water supply, indiscriminately killing Dayan civilians and prisoners on the off chance that an enemy soldier might also fall victim to it. Makaya shoots him down, and Izuka gets so angry that he storms out of the tent because he didn't get to kill random villagers. For some reason, the characters apologize to each other instead of, like, throwing Izuka into a volcano. Prince Peleus has a chat with Micaiah where he's kind of racist, which is hilarious because Micaiah's entire deal is that her slow rate of aging, talent for magic, and slew of miscellaneous powers like sacrifice and glimpses into the future are all because of her half Lagoo's bloodline. I dump all of the bonus EXP I've accumulated so far into Edward. FE10 has a janky system in which levels at base camp always attempt to gain exactly 3 stats, which becomes very very good if some of your stats are already capped out, forcing the game to put points into stats you don't usually gain on level up, like defense on my poor Edward. By heavily investing into Edward every waking moment since the prologue, he's finally become nearly equivalent to base level Zhark. Man, this game sucks. Chapter 7 is classified as an indoor map, so all mounted units take a minus 2 movement penalty. If you bring Fiona for some reason, she also can't climb up ledges because she's on a horse. A squad of allies shows up to help me out, and who is this cutie? God, I hope she's a strong character. Soph recruits the new squad of recruits in this incredible conversation in which Tormod complains about being a manlet. Poor guy. I get it though, the only thing still shorter than Tormod is the full list of chapters where he's playable. Tormod's Tiger Dad has hilariously high stats and can easily solo the chapter, something that happens pretty frequently going forward. Vika is a fair bit worse, but she can fly, which is honestly just a detriment right now since there's both several archers and wind mages guarding the right side of the map and I don't feel like watching Vika take 30 damage from a single enemy. Tormod has a really cool unique skill that gives him extra movement range, but the unfortunate part of skills in Radiant Dawn is that you can just remove these and give them to a better character. There is a benefit to allowing your characters to keep their initial skills to avoid paying the skill point cost to equip them, but it's often much better to do some reshuffling onto units you actually plan to use. I make steady progress throughout the chapter and save all of the prisoners while giving Edward, Nolan, and Jill EXP where possible. Unlike Vika, for some unholy reason, Wyverns do not fall under the traditional umbrella of flying unit and are no longer weak to archers and FE10. Anyone who's played any Fire Emblem can probably tell you that Wyverns did not need to be buffed. Can I mention ahead of time that the best character in this game is a wyvern rider. We cut to Izuka making evil plans out loud without even pretending not to be the bad guy, and Tony the Tiger warns Micaiah that everyone is going to get really racist if they find out that she's mixed race. Things are going poorly for Jared because Benion is sending an inspection team to audit his war crimes, so he decides to solve the problem by doing even more war crimes by planning a mass execution of civilian prisoners. We then get an awkward scene where some wounded soldiers revere Micaiah's healing ability as a sort of pseudo-religious miracle, and I feel like someone should tell them about Laura and her healing staff before Micaiah keels over dead from having to heal more than half of one soldier. Micaiah naively wants to prevent Jared from personally killing every man, woman, and child in the Northern Hemisphere, which makes Izuka really mad because he loves murder and hates people not getting murdered. Nolan is close to promotion, so I use my bonus EXP from saving prisoners to get him caught up. I'd love to help Jill as well, but I arbitrarily can't bring her to Chapter 8, which really sucks because she'd be extremely helpful during a swamp chapter where you can barely move. For some reason, you also can't bring Fiona. I really don't know what, what's going on with that one. Maybe they also thought she'd be too powerful. Chapter 8 opens with a bunch of civilians being tossed into the swamp, and Micaiah heroically runs in to save them before being completely surrounded. Which is okay, because we also have the enemy surrounded, I guess, despite 
explicitly not having any support from the Greater Liberation Army. I really wonder why Jared didn't send more flunkies to his Micaiah killing trap designed to lure in and kill Micaiah. This chapter is honestly kind of stupid because you can solo the entire thing with Nyla, whose stats are a little bit higher than my other units. Moving around the swamp is awkward and clunky, and Tormod's Lagoo Squadron deploys at 0 out of 30 transformation gauge, so they can't actually do anything for 4 or 5 turns unless you brought them some catnip. Morium can kind of fight barehanded, but they don't let you initiate combat yourself in human form. If I were smarter, I could have juggled the Olive Grass between Morim and Vika, and failing to do that means I literally could not figure out how to use Vika in this chapter, even though she's the only flying unit in a giant pit of mud. This is also the last time you'll see Vika for the next 26 chapters, because I am not bringing her to chapter 10. This character got done dirty. The supermodel shampoo guy makes his debut as well, and he has the ability to grant up to 4 units at once another full turn, which is extremely good. I have no idea where or when the enemy reinforcements will show up, and my ability to reactively respond to threats in all directions is completely crippled by all the stupid mud, so one of the prisoners dies to a bandit and the other goes down to an enemy wyvern I couldn't reach. Saving the civilians works for a gameplay objective, but doesn't make any sense narratively because a mass execution was a false flag and the civilians are more valuable alive to use as bait. But who am I to judge the brave men and women of the Benion Empire for ignoring Micaiah in order to pursue their true passion? Killing civilians. Micaiah's mission in the swamp is deemed a heroic success by the Liberation Army who didn't actually come to help. Micaiah and Soph get called over by Tormod because Marim has been poisoned and risks turning into a feral one, a mindless fighting beast with a shortened lifespan utilized by King Ashnard during the events of FE9. Raphael shows up and fixes the problem by singing until Marim feels better. To be honest, if I were sick and a hot man with long hair showed up by my bedside and sang to me, it would definitely fix whatever is wrong with me. It's revealed that evil advisor Izuka pioneered the research behind Feral Lagoo's transformations, which is an enormous war crime in itself, but he was also personally responsible for poisoning Morim. Prince Peleus loves his evil advisor and gives a worthless YouTuber-style apology while trying not to say a slur. Nobody does anything to hold Izuka responsible because no one wants to deprive the sheltered, naive prince of his incredibly influential evil advisor. This is the point where I began to dislike the overall plot. Micaiah's compassion, heroics, and fight for justice comes off as hypocritical and insincere because she will not lay a finger on Izuka and plans to ascend him to the throne, as it's overwhelmingly clear that Peleus is no more than a political puppet in Izuka's palm. The liberation of Dayan comes off as no more than a mission to replace a war criminal with another war criminal. The Empress in Benion has caught wind of the humanitarian crisis in Dayan and appoints an inspection team to parlay of the Liberation Army and put an end to the ongoing conflict and the tyranny that led to its rise. This doesn't go over well with the Senators, who decide to blame Jared for everything, which, to be fair, isn't far off the mark. An emissary from Benion orders Jared to stand down, which leads to the Liberation Army declaring their emancipation and hosting a feast. I really don't want to break it to them that we still have two chapters to go. Chapter 9 starts with Micaiah sneaking out of the victory celebration to have a nap in the woods, and Jared just happens to find Micaiah in the middle of the forest while she's completely alone. The only unit I can use this chapter is Micaiah, who will almost certainly die in one hit from Jared. Conveniently coming to her rescue is the Black Knight, who suddenly teleports in to save Micaiah despite the fact that the two have never met. I have zero clue why both Jared and the Black Knight knew exactly where Micaiah was and that she was alone. You can have Micaiah ask the BK about the unexplained plot shenanigans, to which he says, that isn't important right now. The gameplay of this chapter would have been better off as a cutscene. The Black Knight is totally invulnerable, but some of the enemies carry hand axes and javelins that can one-shot Micaiah if you didn't train her. There are ways around this. It's worth noting that Raphael, back in Chapter 8, shows up holding a Seraph robe, and you could dump that on Micaiah to increase her max HP, but I literally couldn't retrieve it out of base camp because Chapter 9 temporarily removes every character from your army and locks you out of accessing their inventory. Cool. 
You can't particularly plan how to protect Mikaya without just googling where the enemies are, because you can only see a few tiles into the dark, and sending the Burger King too far ahead of Mikaya could result in back reinforcements suddenly trapping her in a corner. There are torches in this game to help you see in the dark, but you can't obtain one by this point. Once I am completely sure that the trickle of enemies has finally stopped, I send the Black Knight to go find Jared. Since a victory condition is to defeat the boss, I made the rookie mistake of assuming the boss is actually somewhere on the map and that you could find him, but what really happened is that he showed up right next to Micaiah and killed her instantly. After redoing the chapter entirely and taking out Jared, we get an emotional death scene in which Jared's flunky takes the blow for him because of their shared love of being terrible, terrible people. The Black Knight decides not to finish the job, and Micaiah lets the bloodthirsty tyrant simply leave after his botched assassination attempt because he is not ours to judge. Given that the entire point of the Day in Liberation Army was to take down Jared specifically, I feel like Micaiah, in fact, maybe should judge. Soph shows up late and loses his cool when he sees the Black Knight, who was a major antagonist in FE9. Micaiah overlooks the Black Knight's past misdeeds because she wants someone strong to liberate Dayan, something they could have accomplished 30 seconds ago by finishing off Jared. The Black Knight insists that he will stop Jared, despite the fact that he could have already done that and chose not to. I feel like I'm going to get a headache if I think about this for too long. After returning home, Jared throws a tantrum and murders the messenger from Benion that told him to stand down, before turning the castle's siege weapons onto you guessed it, the civilian population. Look, Jared, you have to find a different hobby. The Black Knight had promised to stop whatever it was that Jared was planning. This is a man who is both invincible and can teleport, so I guess he didn't feel like following up on his promise. Izuka, of course, does not want Micaiah to go rescue civilians because it might make Peleus look bad if people like her too much. This causes Peleus to have a crisis about being useless, and he finally makes a decision for himself and gives a genuinely good speech to rally the troops before the final battle. I'm glad to get to see him get character development. I can finally forge steel weapons, so I get myself some upgrades to keep units like Edward and Jill strong enough to take down enemies in one round of combat. I then go ahead and promote Jill, so the only person still waiting at this point is Micaiah, who can't be promoted until the story tells her to. Chapter 10 allows you to bring both Nyla and the Black Knight, in case one unit with stats in the 40s wasn't good enough. For some godsforsaken reason, you can't bring Teronio, who is the only character in Part 1 that doesn't show up for the finale, despite being a steady presence in the story beginning in Chapter 5. You can only use him during Chapter 6, after which he sits around in your base camp, pretending to be a unit in your army. The gameplay of the chapter feels kind of stiff and awkward, forcing your units to climb up through one tile choke points and you do need to go reasonably fast because thieves spawn in to steal all of the valuable loot. The potential difficulty of the chapter is completely poisoned by the idea that you could, at any time, just have Nyla or the Black Knight run up through the middle and solo the chapter. Despite how much the original Dawn Brigade cast gets overshadowed by this point, I do my best to continue training my weaker units like Edward and Nolan when I get a chance. Volu gets enough action to very nearly reach S rank and strike, which will be a substantial 5 points of additional damage when I can tip him over the finish line. And while Jill's strength is a touch behind, her defense is way ahead of the curve. I wish I could say the same for Edward. With Jared unceremoniously defeated, Peleus congratulates Micaiah by promoting her from General of the Liberation Army to General of the Liberation Army which causes her to get a cute new outfit and finally as much speed as base level Edward. After Peleus ascends the throne, Micaiah goes outside the chat with Tormod, inexplicably asking him to forgive Izuka for the murder attempt on Maureen. With Dayan's liberation complete, Tormod plans to skip town because Dayan's citizens are typically, like, super racist, which makes Micaiah cry because she apparently just learned what racism is. Nyla and Raphael plan to head out alongside Tormod, who's going to escort them across the continent to reunite Raphael with his surviving family, which is the entire reason they came here in the first place, and I'm still unsure why they hung around in Dayan to help out Micaiah for so long. Not to deprive Micaiah of the family dog, Nyla sends back Bolug. I guess Micaiah gets to keep him. With the first story arc of the game completed, you get a movie trailer cutscene to hype up the next story arc, which seems a bit silly because the second arc is super short. 
Regardless, Radiant Dawn is a massive game with roughly 40 chapters, and I may as well break up the videos to match the major story arc so this video isn't two hours long. Two of countries and kings. Oh, uh, hey there. The gameplay is done for now, but I have some closing thoughts if you feel like sticking around. I'm still experimenting with my style of content. I have no idea if this Let's Play style will work out, but if you enjoyed this and want more of it, let me know down in the comments so I can get a sense of which one of my future video ideas to prioritize first since it might take me weeks to finish my next video at the rate I'm going. I'm going to focus on YouTube for a while and hopefully produce more content, so subscribe if you want to be notified of my future videos. Thank you. I hope to see you again soon. Cheers.